Hello and welcome to CEY 2019. My name is Graham Blackus and today I'm going to take you through a presentation called Glaucoma, Mistakes I've Made and Lessons I've Learned. In this presentation, I'm going to go through the main areas where practitioners can run into problems in their management of glaucoma. And there are three main areas. Number one is a failure to detect the disease, or as I like to say, not actively looking for glaucoma in your routine eye exams. Number two is the making of an incorrect diagnosis or not actively thinking about your glaucoma diagnosis. Number three is suboptimal management of the disease itself. And that generally comes with not knowing enough about the condition or the treatments available to you. A very important part of glaucoma management is recognizing that not all optic neuropathies are glaucomatous and making that error can sometimes be sight threatening or life threatening for the patient. Towards the later part of the lecture, we'll talk about incorporating clinical strategies to help minimize such errors in glaucoma management. And I'll give you some real life scenarios. Most of these things that have happened have been errors or omissions that I've made in the past in my earlier days, or errors that I've seen in patients that have been referred to me for assessment. Having said that, most glaucoma is typically very straightforward to diagnose and doesn't form much of a clinical challenge. The vast majority of glaucoma patients don't deteriorate or deteriorate very slowly over time once their treatment has been initiated. Most glaucoma patients will not experience severe vision loss in their lifetimes. The vast majority of glaucoma patients can be readily managed non-surgically by their optometrist. So really, there's no need to be scared of glaucoma. What we'll talk about today is areas where it may trip you up and may cause issues, but that won't be in the vast majority of our patients. All right, let's talk about glaucoma diagnosis. The difficulty with glaucoma is that clinical diagnosis of the disease is inexact and imprecise science. We don't have a definitive diagnostic test for glaucoma. We have to rely on a battery of structural tests and a battery of functional tests that give us little bits of different information about the disease. Even with those tests, there's no definitive glaucomatous test result. There's a large overlap in test findings between patients who have glaucoma and patients that don't. For example, you can have glaucoma with a cup to disc ratio of zero, but not have glaucoma with a cup to disc of 0.8. Alternatively, you can develop glaucoma at a pressure of 15, but not have glaucoma with pressures of 28. Because of these major overlaps between the disease and the normal population, it is easy to make errors in diagnosis if you're not careful. Once you make a glaucoma diagnosis, that leads to more questions. Do we actually need to initiate therapy in every case? Which patients deserve treatment? which patients can be spared the burden of treatment and can safely be monitored. George Spath, head of Will's Glaucoma Clinic, says from an ethical point of view, failing to treat is just as significant as treating. But for each patient, we must ask ourselves, does treatment offer a benefit? And does that benefit exceed the potential consequences of no treatment? And this is where there can be difficulties and differences of opinion between different practitioners. The same glaucoma circumstance in the same patient might be managed differently between different practitioners. There are different glaucoma treatment options. Speaking of topical treatment, at the moment we have seven classes of drugs, prostaglandin analogs, beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, alpha agonists, pilocarpine cholinergics, the rho kinase inhibitor, inhibitors and the new nitric oxide donating latanoprostine bunode. With lasers, we have SLT and PIs. We have cataract surgery and minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, such as the eye stent. We have more serious trabeculectomy and tube shunt surgery. So there are a lot of options in how to manage the patient and which is the best option for the particular patient that's in your chair. Often there is a difference of opinion on the best way to manage these patients. And if you choose the wrong option, that may lead to a poorer outcome for your patient. There are differences in opinion between optometry and ophthalmology. And in optometry, depending on your state-based laws, some practitioners will favor laser treatment ahead of topical therapy and others will go the other, the other direction. So when did things go wrong in glaucoma? If we look at historical medical malpractice claims data, glaucoma presents a small proportion of all the malpractice claims of around 
And if you look more closely on the reasons why the malpractice claims were filed, the main causes are a failure to diagnose the pre presence of glaucoma, i.e. failure to detect the disease. Then there's also cases where there was a failure to diagnose progression or worsening of the disease. There are several cases where an incorrect diagnosis has been made. This is a surprising one to me. There were a number of cases of abandonment where the patient claims that their disease was not treated properly and that they weren't told the importance of returning for follow-up visits. And for the ophthalmology colleagues, there's also surgical misadventure, but that doesn't make up the larger proportion of glaucoma malpractice claims. There's some good news. Only 30% of glaucoma malpractice claims resulted in a payout. And that comes down to the problem of malocurrence versus malpractice. Even if you manage glaucoma pro properly, some patients will still deteriorate, and that's really not the fault of the practitioner. Now, medical malpractice issues are actually more prevalent in glaucoma than surgical. So if you look at the data, 132 cases due to medical mismanagement and only 58 during to due to surgical procedures, and 98% of the cases were settled prior to getting to court. Now, the responsibility to detect glaucoma rests predominantly with the optometrist. It doesn't rest with the PCP, the pharmacist, or even the ophthalmologist. Optometrists are the primary eye care providers. They perform the vast majority of routine periodic eye exams. In fact, in Australia, ophthalmology is strictly a secondary and tertiary care profession. You cannot visit an ophthalmologist directly without having a referral from an optometrist. Good thing about glaucoma is the onset of the disease tends to mirror the onset of presbyopia, and most patients who are becoming presbyopic tend to present to an optometrist. The difficulty is glaucoma is almost always an asymptomatic disease. If it goes undetected by the optometrist, the patient can suffer severe and sometimes unnecessary vision loss. So having said that, how have optometrists performed in glaucoma diagnosis? If we look at the data from the Melbourne Vision Impairment Project, which was run in the late 1990s, comprehensive eye exams were performed in the study on several thousand um, members of the general population in Melbourne. Many cases of newly diagnosed glaucoma were detected. The problem was that half the patients with newly diagnosed glaucoma had already been seen by an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, or sometimes by both of those practitioners in the previous 12 months, and the glaucoma diagnosis had been missed. When they did their statistical analysis, they found that optometrists missed more cases of glaucoma than ophthalmologists. And if you break it down at different decades, you'll find that in the 50 to 59 decade, the vast majority of the glaucomas were undiagnosed and same in the 70 to 79 age group. About three quarters of them were undiagnosed after having previously seen an optometrist. In the 90 plus year olds, we seem to do a lot better. So why? Why are optometrists missing all these cases of glaucoma? Optometrists are highly trained professionals and they're very caring. So why are they missing so many of these cases? And there's probably two reasons. It's because in the past we've relied mostly on cup to disc ratio and intraocular pressure to make a diagnosis of glaucoma. But both of those tests have very poor sensitivity for glaucoma. They have a high variability in the normal population. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a large overlap in the clinical results of those tests between those with glaucoma and those that are normal. A careful stereoscopic assessment of the optic nerve is really the only reliable way to detect glaucoma. Cup to disc ratio on its own is a poor diagnostic indicator because glaucoma can occur at almost any cup to disc ratio. If you're going to assess the optic nerve, you need to do a detailed and systematic disc evaluation. And that involves looking at the size of the disc based on the border with the scleral ring and you have to take a close look at the neuroretinal rim tissue to make sure there's no areas of notching and that the disc follows the isn't rule. Vascular changes such as disc hemorrhages, bearing of the blood vessels, bayonetting of the blood vessels can also indicate glaucoma and the development of beta peripapillary atrophy and loss of brightness of the nerve fiber layer, especially inferiorly and superiorly, are big clues that glaucoma is occurring. A good way to improve your glaucoma detection is to take this course by Murray Fingeret called the five R's of glaucoma diagnosis. 
he basically breaks it down into looking at the scleral ring, the neuroretinal rim, the regions around the disc that develop PPA, the retinal vessels and the retinal nerve fiber layer. They're the five R's. It's available as a webinar on Review of Optometry website and also as a paper in optometry and I've given the reference there for you. If you look at the discs in that fashion each and every time, it's going to be very difficult for you to miss glaucoma changes. And to refine your diagnosis even more, you can go on to gone-project.com, which was a website developed here in Melbourne, Australia, where you're presented images of optic nerves in different states from normal glaucoma suspects to definite glaucoma, and you're required to analyze them systematically and then make a diagnosis. You have 90 seconds for each disc, and at the end of that time, you can then check whether you've made the correct diagnosis or not. Very good practice to do. Right, why is optic nerve head size the first of the five R's? The vertical disc diameter is one of the primary structural disc features that needs to be determined in every patient. Cup to disc ratio, not so much. Now the hole in the rear of the sclera called the scleral foramen determines the size of your optic nerve. The number of retinal ganglion cells is actually fairly similar between different eyes. It doesn't matter the size of the globe or the size of the scleral opening. Most retinas have around 1.25 million ganglion cell axons within the retina. So if those axons are leaving via a very small scleral opening, the disc will be more crowded and there won't be any optic nerve cupping. However, if you've got a large hole in the sclera, there's more space for those axons to leave, and they'll tend to leave around the border of the scleral foramen, and you'll have a larger optic nerve cup in the center. Therefore, if you think about it, your cup to disc ratio is intrinsically linked to the size of your optic nerve head. So if you tell somebody the cup to disc ratio is 0.3, it's actually pretty meaningless to us in terms of diagnosing glaucoma without knowing what kind of disc size it belongs to. As we said, a small disc should have minimal to no cupping. Regular sized discs often have a cup that's between 0.2 and 0.5, and large discs have larger cups, often 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, even 0.8 in cup to disc ratio. Because discs that are small have very crowded optic nerves, glaucomatous changes are often very difficult to detect on small discs. You can often have moderate axonal loss without developing an optic nerve cup at all. You can actually have quite dramatic ganglion cell loss even with mild cup to disc ratios of 0.3. And often the visual field and OCT losses you see are well out of proportion to the cup to disc ratio and it can actually quite surprise you. Conversely, large optic nerves tend to be classified as glaucoma suspects unnecessarily and are over-investigated, while the small discs tend to be under-investigated for glaucoma and the glaucoma diagnosis gets missed. Now, Jerome Sherman, who also presents on CEY, has written paper about this um, titled Glaucoma Without Cupping, and it presents, I think, over 10 cases where glaucoma was present without any disc cupping at all. So it's not necessarily rare. So our action plan as clinicians is to make sure we measure the vertical disc diameter at each initial new patient visit to our practice. And that way we can place the cup to disc ratio in proportion to the disc size, and that'll give us a clue whether glaucoma may be present or not. In fact, I would usually recommend anyone with a small disc gets worked up as a glaucoma suspect because otherwise you may not have any clues that the disease is present at all based on things like cup to disc ratio and isn't rule. Now, there are several methods that we can use to measure disc size. One is to measure it directly at the slit lamp with your fundus lens using indirect ophthalmoscopy. You adjust the vertical slit height unless, until it matches the vertical disc diameter, and then you apply a magnification factor. For example, with a 90D lens, you would multiply that figure by 1.3 because that lens tends to minify the retinal image, while with a 60-60D or, or a 60D lens, you can usually measure the disc size directly. Anything under 1.5 millimeters is considered a small disc, between 1.5 to 1.8 millimeters is a regular or medium sized disc and above 1.8 millimeters is a large disc. The other way we can do it is to make an estimation using the medium sized aperture on our direct ophthalmoscope. 
Really, we don't need to know the exact vertical disk diameter down to two decimal places. Knowing whether it's small, medium or large is usually enough. So here we've got three disks that we photographed. We place the medium sized aperture from our direct ophthalmoscope. It seems to be equal size to the disk. That's a regular sized disk. If the disk is larger than the aperture, it's obviously a large disk. And if the disk is smaller than the light aperture, it's smaller than normal. So that way you can classify a disk as small.